Hey, thanks for tuning in to our new series in Philippians called No Matter What, part two. Have you ever thought to yourself, if I just had better health, or better relationships, or a better job, or better circumstances, or more money, then I would have joy. Sure you have. You know, I think it's just human nature to get focused on what we don't have, rather than being grateful for what we do have. You know, I've got a relatively new truck. I love it, I love it, I love it. It's paid for, but during a storm, a branch fell on it and left a small dent on the hood. Now when I come out to my new truck, guess what I tend to focus on? Rather than focus on the privilege of driving a beautiful paid for truck, I'm focused on that stinking dent. Urgh. Right? We often think we need dentless lives or better circumstances in order to have joy. But the scriptures and the examples of the Apostle Paul say otherwise. In fact, the truth is there's only one thing that you and I need to experience joy day in and day out, and that is a made up mind. Someone put make up your mind in the chat. That's right, because of what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do in our lives, we can make up our mind that we're going to live joyfully regardless of our situation. You, you may have some obstacles, and the world might seem like it's on fire right now, I get that. But you don't have to allow them to steal your joy. The Lord often likes to use my life as an object lesson, which, you know, when I'm about to teach on certain subjects. So this Tuesday, you know, I got two pieces of rough news, and it was as if the Lord was going, okay, Dan, how are you going to respond? You're going to stand up and tell people that they can have joy regardless of the situation, so now prove it. So I made up my mind to thank the Lord, not for the news, but for His goodness, which didn't change my outer world, but made a huge difference in my inner world. So we need to make up our mind. We need to begin each day thinking about all the things that we have to be thankful for. Start each morning like the writer of Psalm 118 and declare, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now I'm just going to take a shot in the dark. I, I think probably for most of us, that isn't our default mode. When our feet hit the floor each morning, we have trained our minds not to focus on how blessed we are, but on what we're lacking. Our feet hit the floor and we think, man, I need more money, or I need something else. I need to do things on my to-do list. Or we might start out the day with worry or complaining or focusing on negative things. Instead, we need to train our minds to be grateful, for that is God's will for our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now notice it doesn't say that all circumstances are good. They're not. But the reason we can give thanks is because Jesus is always good. Do you know what that means? That means if you are a Jesus follower, God is committed to helping you recalibrate your attitude towards becoming a thankful person. Bottom line, guys, grateful people are fun to be around. Thankful people get noticed and promoted. Thankful people have learned the secret of having joy where they are so God can take them to a new level. Grateful people are joyful people. In fact, the antidepressant Wellbutrin boosts the neurotransmitter dopamine and the antidepressant Prozac affects your levels of serotonin. But gratitude naturally does both of those. Before you look at your phone in the morning or brush your teeth or eat breakfast, we need to make up our mind to thank the Lord for the day He has made. Thank the Lord that, man, this is a day full of possibilities, opportunities, and resources from you. Rabbi Zacharias is a world-renowned thinker and defender of the Christian faith, and he passed away recently. At his funeral, one of the speakers commented that the first thing he did every day would be to thank the Lord. You know, it's so simple, but it's a powerful way to start your day. It's almost impossible to go around depressed and down when you carry an attitude of thankfulness. Well, you might be thinking, oh, that's great, Pastor Dan. I would do that, but I got to get up each day in my tiny house and then drive my crummy car to a job that I hate. <laughs> oh my goodness. Do you realize that the things you are ungrateful for are the answer to somebody else's prayers? Man, they would love to be able to get out of bed, but they can't. They would love to have a place to call their own. They would love to have a car of any kind. They would love to have a job. We've got so much to be grateful for. I heard a true story of a man who was changing the tire of his car on the side of the road, and he got hit by a drunk driver. The accident crushed both of his legs, and they had to be amputated. 
His pastor went to see him in the hospital to cheer him up. But when he got there, the man had a big smile on his face and said, Man, don't feel sorry for me. I'm not a victim, but a victor. I may have lost my legs, but I haven't lost my joy. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't even be here. You know, some people focus on what they don't have or what they've lost and spiral downward. Though we need to be like this man and thank God for what we have left. That pastor had come to cheer him up, but because this man had already made up his mind to focus on the goodness of God, he was already up. Now, hear me now. We're not talking about a denial of reality today, like bad things don't happen or hard circumstances don't exist. God, just turn on the news, right? What we're talking about is which portion of your reality are you going to dwell on? Does that make sense? You know, I'm not denying or ignoring the bad, otherwise we could never make any positive changes in our life. But my overriding focus is, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you've got this. Thank you that you are making a way. Thank you for how blessed I already am. You know, being grateful to God is one of the keys of living a joyful life. We have to train our minds to look for the good, dwell on the positive, and affirm what we do have, rather than obsess over what's wrong or broken or been lost. I think it's instructive for us that the very first words beyond the preliminary greetings in chapter 1 of Paul's letter to the Philippians are words of thanksgiving to God and for others. Here he was, in prison, chained 24 hours a day to a Roman guard, not knowing if he will live or die, suffering chronic pain for all that he's been through. And the first words out of his mouth are, Send me some Chick-fil-A, man. You know, hey, I'll take a spicy deluxe, please, with a large lemonade. Ooh, doesn't that sound good? Or I'll take some Tylenol, right? But he's thanking God for the people in his life. Turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, as Paul will show us three ways to have greater joy in our relationships. All right, let's, let's get into it. The first way is to make up your mind to be grateful for the people in your life. Look at Philippians 1, 3 through 5. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, Paul is implying that the people or the circumstances surrounding the start of the church at Philippi were ideal. I mean, far from it. In Acts 16, we learn that Paul was trying to go somewhere else when the Lord redirected him to Philippi with a vision of a man from Macedonia pleading for him to come over and help them. But when he gets there, he doesn't find a man because there weren't enough Jewish men to form a synagogue. He, he goes outside the city to a place of prayer and there he doesn't find, again, a man, but he finds a woman named Lydia who is a business owner and becomes the first person in Europe to put her faith in Christ. Paul continues his ministry while being followed around by a demon-possessed slave girl who her master is exploited for a fortune-telling business. The girl keeps shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God telling you the way to be saved. Finally, Paul has had enough, and he just delivers her from that demon. Her owners are furious and start a mob against Paul and Silas, and they're severely beaten without trial and thrown into jail. At midnight, they start pr singing praises to God, and he sends an earthquake to open all the prison doors. The jailer, who probably had a hand in beating them, is about to commit suicide, thinking that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul instead leads him and his family to the Lord. Now, I find it interesting that Paul doesn't focus on any of that, but instead makes up his mind to remember the good things about people and focus on the good times you've had. Rather than focus on his suffering, or injustice, or the wild and wacky characters who made up this early church, he focused on a strength of theirs, which was their partnership in spreading the gospel. And although poor, they were incredibly generous towards Paul's ministry, which is also a characteristic of our church. That is what we wanted to choose to focus on. He learned from all the bad that he practiced having a selective memory. I remember hearing a story one time about two women talking, and one of the wives said to the other, don't you remember that time when your husband did you wrong? And she said, hmm, I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> remember my truck story? We have to make a choice of what we're going to focus on. The dent, the flaws, the faults, or things that are good. 
You know, when marriages stop focusing on the good and start focusing on the dense, they begin to crumble. When you stop remembering why you got married in the first place, what attracted you to that person, and start being critical rather than grateful, then the relationship is going to suffer. When we start complaining, you know, or comparing about our, our husband to Romeo over there who brings gifts and flowers to his wife all the time, resentment can start to settle in. How do you know if behind closed doors Romeo may be a jerk or unfaithful or shackled to some addiction? Wouldn't it be wiser to thank God for the solid guy that you've got? I heard a story about a middle-aged guy who was walking on the beach and he stubbed his toe on something metallic. When he rubbed the sand off the object, out popped a genie. The genie declared, as a token of my gratitude for being released after a thousand year imprisonment, I'll grant you three wishes. The man thinks for a minute and wishes for great riches. Poof. Done. Next, he wishes for a mansion on a private island. Poof. Done. Finally, he goes, man, I wish my wife was 20 years younger than me, and poof, the genie made the man 70 years old. <laughs> you know, it's always better to be grateful for what you have. But Dan, you may be thinking, you don't know my spouse, or my parents, or my kids, or my boss. They are driving me crazy. Now, that may be true, but is that because you're focusing on all their faults and hang-ups? Or are you thanking God for their good qualities? Have you ever discovered if you expect the worst of people, you'll find it? The opposite is also true. Did you ever stop to think that even the most difficult people in your life aren't there by accident? God wants to use them for good in your life if you will humble yourself and learn what He wants you to learn. Now let me ask you to be real honest, okay? When you think of the people in your life, are you automatically grateful? Maybe we get there eventually, but if we're being honest, sometimes it isn't our first thought, right? The longer you know someone, the easier it becomes to take them for granted. Isn't that true? And the more we take people for granted, it just becomes increasingly easier to forget all that is good in them. And when we lose sight of how special they are, and all we can see are the stinking dents, is it any wonder that the relationship isn't very positive? Guys, my life is so brief. We won't always have one another. We shouldn't have to almost lose someone in an accident or get a diagnosis of only a few months to live before we start being grateful for the people in our lives. Psalm 90.12 says, Teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. How would you live if, you, if, if the people that you loved only had a short time to live? Why not live that way now? Have you told the people in your world that you love them recently? You know, every day is a gift. And sometimes we wait until Thanksgiving to give thanks, or Christmas to give gifts, and Valentine's Day to express love. Meanwhile, the clock ticks. We think today is just an ordinary day, and precious moments pass by. But really, there are no ordinary days. This is the day the Lord has made, so let us make up our mind to rejoice, and be glad in it, and be grateful for the people in our lives. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks. See, he's making a choice, isn't he? If we would just develop this habit, whenever we think of people in our life, our friends, our neighbors, our husband, our wife, our kids, our relatives, if our first thought would be one of gratitude, man, it could be a game changer. We can choose to be thankful for something about the people in our lives, which can contribute to our joy, or we can fester on their faults. What are you gonna make up your mind to do? The second way to have greater joy in our relationships is to make up your mind to be grateful for people's progress. Look at Philippians 1, 6. It reads, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Man, this is one of the greatest promises in the Bible. When God starts something in a person's life, he will finish it. Now, we tend to be really good at starting things, but praise God, He is really good at finishing things. So what does this have to do with joy in relationships? If you insist on near perfection to people, both you and those you're putting pressure on will be miserable because it's an unrealistic standard. But Paul had made up his mind to see the Philippians not as a finished product, but people under construction. Or in other words, be patient with people's progress, because we are all under construction. 
you know, I have the ability to visualize how a construction project will look when it is finished even before we start. I can see it right there. But as every remodeler knows, you have to create a huge mess before you can begin to see the beauty of the finished product. Now there's dust and dirt and wires hanging out and holes in the walls and floor and so on. Melody would often get discouraged during these stages because the mess was a little overwhelming with young children handling live wires and putting nails in their mouth and falling through holes in the floor, <laughs> right? Well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but that might explain a few things about my children, right? But then I would remind her of the progress that has been made and what it's all going to look like when it's done. You know, we need to look beyond the mess in people's lives and trust God that He will bring it all to completion. Right now, you and the people in your, in your life are under construction. It's messy. At times, it is discouraging, but we need to be patient and remember that God isn't finished yet. You know, when Micah was in about the second grade, he sang a song in a talent show. Of course, I'm a little biased. I would have given him the golden buzzer, but he was so cute with his bowl haircut singing the song, He's Still Working On Me. The chorus goes, He's still working on me to make me what I need to be. It took just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. You know, if you want to have better relationships, we need to celebrate how far people have come rather than judging them for how far they still have to go. Yes, we want to call people to a higher standard, but we also need to celebrate their progress. Researchers of interpersonal relationships point out the 5 to 1 principle. It appears that criticism imprints on the brain almost immediately, but it takes five affirmations of someone's progress for them to hear us and have it actually stick. I know, I'm in trouble too. But what that tells me is that we need to be liberal with praise and very, very conservative with criticism. You know, when my kids were little, they would draw me pictures and bring them to me and say, what do you think, Daddy? And I would say, it's perfect. It's amazing. And when I said it's perfect, does that mean it's on the same level of a Rembrandt painting? Well, of course not. It was perfect in my eyes and for the stage of life that they were at. It might look like random scribbles and a mess to someone else, but in their daddy's eyes, it was beautiful. Aren't you glad that is how your Heavenly Father looks at you and the people in your world? You know, all we can see sometimes is the mess. But in his eyes, it's all part of our development. Now you might be looking at someone in your life and all you can see is construction mess. Their faults and problems are so glaring that it's hard to see anything else. We need to join Paul and by faith declare that God is working in your people and he will keep at it and he will keep at it and be on the lookout for progress to celebrate in their lives. You know, when Melody and I were dating, she went with back to my hometown to meet my parents. And while there, she came across former teachers of mine who were anxious to meet the woman I was going to marry and tell her that their uh, faith in God went way up when they heard how I had actually turned out. They then went on to tell her stories of what a rascal I had been in school. You know, that's kind of a backhanded way of thanking God for my progress, but I guess I'll take it. You know, Philippians 1.6 should be a massive encouragement to anybody who has a person that they love in their life that's a mess, even if it's you. It's so sad to drive by abandoned construction sites and wonder what could have been. But God isn't like that. There are no abandoned construction sites with God. He is committed to our progress, and He's constantly nudging His kids in the right directions. Now we just need to join Him in that direction. Consider Abraham, who God promised would have a son and be the father of many nations. The only problem was that he was really old and his wife Sarah was really old and they didn't have any kids. So a lot of time goes by and they aren't getting any younger and so Sarah suggests that Abraham sleep with her maid and have a child through her. That would become theirs. Abraham says, well, okay, right? And the maid gives birth to a son named Ishmael. The only problem is God tells them that this isn't the promised child. And Sarah and Abraham begin to fight and there's all kinds of strife. Sarah says, I can't believe you slept with that woman. And Abraham is going, what are you talking about? You told me to, right? And she says, but you never should have listened to me. Oh my goodness. This Sarah gives an ultimatum. Either she goes or I go. And this broke Abraham's heart as he loved Ishmael. 
but he finally sent them away. Now Abraham is the father, <laughs> he's our father of our faith, you know? But you'd be hard pressed to find a more dysfunctional family than this one. It was messy and full of strife and division. Most people would have written them off. He would say, man, you need to have your own reality TV show, like Desperate Housewives of the Bible. You've got so much drama in your house. But God looked at them and said, under construction. And that's not the end of their story. As later God gave them their promised child, and they named him Laughter or Isaac. And although there was a lot of mess, they stayed the course and they made up their mind to trust God and to thank him for his promises. So we need to be patient with others' progress, but also with our progress as well. You know, sometimes our progress feels like we're, we're surfing on a glacier. woo Feel the rush! We're really, we're not moving, right? It doesn't feel like we're getting anywhere. But everyone makes progress really the same way the snails got into Noah's Ark, inch by inch. The model for those who have made up their mind to be grateful for progress is, you know what, I'm not the person I want to be, but thank God I'm not the person I used to be. So we need to celebrate progress, yours and others. Finally, we need to make up our mind to be grateful for people in prayer. Look at Philippians 1, 7 through 11 in the Living Bible. It says, how natural it is that I should feel as I do about you. For you have a very special place in my heart. We have shared together the blessings of God, both when I was in prison and when I was out, defending the truth and telling others about Christ. Only God knows how deep is my love and longing for you with the tenderness of Jesus Christ. My prayer for you is that you will overflow more and more with love for others, and at the same time, keep on growing in spiritual knowledge and insight. For I want you always to see clearly the difference between right and wrong and to be inwardly clean. No one being able to criticize you from now until our Lord returns. May you always be doing those good, kind things that show you are a child of God. For His will will bring much praise and glory to the Lord. Can you hear how much Paul loves these people? even though he hasn't seen them for over 10 years. You know, most of us would say that we love people in our lives, but those same people are often on our nerves, right? Paul had discovered, if people aren't on my heart through prayer, they're usually on my nerves. You know, if I'm praying for somebody, they just don't bug me as much. They just don't bother me as much. If they're on my heart through prayer, they're not as likely to be on my nerves. The scripture declares in James that the prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. And we may never know how God uses our prayers to assist the people in our lives. But in the book of Exodus, God told Moses to go up onto the mountain again to meet with him and get additional instructions for the new nation of Israel. This, this is uh, not his first time. But Moses is gone for another 40 days and 40 nights and the people begin to grow impatient. And they assume he must be dead up there somewhere. So they convince Aaron to make a golden calf as their new object of worship. And they make sacrifices to it. And they had a drunken party. And God is rightfully ticked because they knew better. They had the Ten Commandments. God says, that's it. I'm going to give them all what they deserve and wipe them out. But Moses stands in the gap in prayer. And he pleads with God to show mercy. Moses isn't praying for mercy for his own sins, but for the sins of others. And in Psalms 106, it says that God would have wiped them out if Moses hadn't stood in the gap in prayer. Sometimes we're frustrated with people. I get that. Their lives are a mess. They consistently make bad choices. They may have wandered from God, and they're getting wiped out in many areas of life. But I wonder what would happen if one person would begin to stand in the gap for them in prayer. You know, Paul didn't just say, you're in my heart but you're also down on, on my knees in prayer. Maybe you are the Moses in your family. Maybe you are the Moses for your friends or co-workers and you're going to stand in the gap for them. You may not realize it, but many of the good things and protection you have experienced are the direct result of people's prayers in your life. You know, Melody and I are living in the blessings of the prayers of our parents and grandparents. We know that. We are so blessed to have the spiritual heritage that each of us have. And I try to continue that heritage by praying the great commandment for my family every day. 
the great commandment, do you know that? That they would love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and also love their neighbor as themselves. Those who call Faith Community Church home are also living in the blessings of people whom you will never meet this side of heaven, who prayed for our church and for you to prosper. It was just about dead and gone about 21 years ago when we came, but God honored those precious prayers so that now you can participate in what they were praying for. So have you made up your mind to be grateful for people in prayer? Paul prays this amazing prayer in verses 9 through 11, that these dear people would grow in the most important quality of all, love. He prays for knowledge second, because when God wants to measure someone, he puts a tape around their heart, not their head. To not pray for the people in our lives might be easier, but it isn't loving. And God doesn't want to see your family or friends get wiped out by circumstances. But He's calling to you and I to be a Paul. Calling to you and I to be a Moses in their life. And stand in the gap for them. Do they need help? Stand in the gap. Do they need to know God? Stand in the gap. Do they need resources? Stand in the gap. You know, Paul had made up his mind in advance what he was going to focus on. His chains, or his treatment, or his conditions, or his circumstances, or even the weather didn't get a vote on his outlook for the day. Have you made up your mind? Have you already set your coordinates for the day? The Apostle of Joy had already done that, and it was, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the people in my life and their progress and the privilege to pray for them. This is the day that the Lord has made, so I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. If you believe it and receive it, say amen. Say amen. Let's pray together. Lord, I just want to thank you for those that are tuning in right now. Lord, I pray that you would help us in these crazy times, God, to make a decision in advance that we would make up our mind that this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, our focus is on, is on you. Our focus is not so much on circumstances. Our focus is not so much on the news and everything that's going on. God, our focus is on you. And so, regardless of what happens, Lord, I, play, I pray that you keep us in a place of joy. Lord, I also pray for those that might be tuning in right now. And maybe they've never come to a place where they put their faith in Christ. They, they've never come to a place where they realize, you know what? I can't do life on my own any longer. I need forgiveness for my sins. I need Jesus in my life. I don't, I don't need just to know about Jesus. I need Him living in my life to help me go a different direction. If that's you today, you can ask Jesus to forgive your sins and come into your life and uh, help you begin to live the life that He created you to live. If that's you today, if you are making that decision, would you text decision FCC, all one word, to 84576? We would love to send you some resources to help you get started in your Christian life. And hey, by the way, don't leave just yet. We've got more worship to come. And of course, the infamous bloopers at the end. And God bless you guys and see you all at the outdoor worship night on Friday at 7 p.m. See you then.